to the author of Dig. Um, we have spent the last month talking and reading about it and it has sparked so many conversations. And so students, you're invited to come up and ask your questions. Um, we have the list of them there. Um, really, thank you so much, Amy. I want the kids to take this away. I have a question though for you really yeah. quickly, Meg. What made you decide to do this? What made oh. you, like what, what, what started this whole thing? <laughs> well, reading, I mean, buying the, at some point, you know, I realized after I had read this, after you had published it in hardcover, you know, with a different cover, I found out like, it's an essential book. It's an essential book for young people to, to read. And so yeah. hosting book groups here as well, is just, I think it actually should be a, like a part of our curriculum. And I know some of our students are going to talk to you about that, but especially in Vermont, we are a school that has that flies a Black Lives Matter flag out on our yeah. flagpole in the front. That's why I want to move there, Meg. That's why I want to move there. <laughs> we're a school that that successfully raised a student-led campaign to ban the Confederate flag on our campus, not just the parking lot, but campus, right? And it sparked conversations in our school. And, and as we evolve in this, these conversations towards equity and racial justice, really thinking about like, what is our role as white students, white people, white humans in, in this and your book just like Jeannie and I were speaking before you got on the call there we can't think of another book that unpacks the uh, the roots of white supremacy in the way that you do so it's a, a conversation sparker that we hope um continues throughout our building awesome all right let's give it to the students and thank you for that explanation because I didn't know where exactly this started so good morning guys how's it going how's Vermont today cool. awesome throw questions at me Ask me whatever you want. I'm an open book, no pun um, intended. I'm Elijah. And so my, my, my question basically comes down to this. So, so I, I'm, I'm, I am currently talking with the English teachers here about putting the book as part of our curriculum because it's, it's far better than some of the other books we're reading. Um, but I, 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 I want to know about your decision to write it as uh, and much much more in the style of a of a y of a, of a yeah of a, of, a, of, a, of a YA book. Ah, brilliant question. Not that okay. well. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you, and nice to meet you, Elijah. Um, great question. Well, here's here's the deal. It's funny. I found myself writing young adult literature. Uh, I'd been writing books for fifteen years, and it took me well, it took me fifteen years to get published. And so I'd written about eight or nine novels. And at that point I was getting rejected a lot because my books were weird and I am female. And it sounds like a very strange combo, but it's very realistic <clears throat> for me to explain to you that this book, like this book will not make me much money come into the future. You know what I'm saying? And, and you know, it's not gonna make me, it's not, it's not a business in that way for me because I am a woman and I write books like this. If I was not a woman uh, and I wrote surrealist or strange fiction, it would be a little different now. Yeah. Um, anyway, shoot, what was my point? Anyway, so when it came to how I ended up in young adult literature is that one of my books, when I finally got an agent, um, was very weird. And somebody called him up and said, you got anything weird? And he said, yeah, I got this book. And he sent this one weird book called The Dust 100 Dogs to this, this editor, but the editor published YA work, young adult work. And so we got on the phone and I had been writing for 15 years thinking I was writing adult work, which I think I am. I think it's a mix. And I think my, my main characters are teenagers. And there's a reason for that. Um, and he, his name is Andrew Carr, the person who bought that first book and also the person who published this book. Okay. So we had a bunch in between where I was with different publishers, but I came back home to Andrew. He is, he is, my favorite, um, and he understands me. Um, but we define, and he defined at the time, um, young adult work as being about young adults versus for young adults. And for me, my original plan, when I first wanted to be an author, I was in eighth grade, and I wrote down on a legal tablet that I wanted to help adults understand teenagers better and help teenagers understand adults better. And I believe that that is exactly what my work does because I've fully formed adults, whether they be grandparents or parents, um, and if, if adults would read these books, then they would get a, a glimpse into young adult literature. Now, like most things or young adults life, I should say. Um, and like most things, teen in our culture, we roll our eyes. Right. So, and, and also young adult work can also be, you know, a little bit like snack food in spots, but so can adult work, like going to any bookstore, there's snack food everywhere. Um, but then, then you've got your, your shelves where there's 
more more thoughtful. I don't know, not, not more thoughtful. Everybody thinks it's hard to write a book, no matter what kind of book you write. Um, but when it comes to why this ended up in young adults, A, because I was there, B, because it's the one place a weird woman can publish Elijah. Okay, I'm really being serious. I would not be able to publish my surreal books um, like Switch, which came after it, or, or those sorts of more surreal ideas if I wasn't in young adult literature because women don't, aren't usually allowed on that playing field. But the biggest one is because I care very much about teenagers, the mental health of teenagers. And I believe that your generation at generation 15, if you start thinking, you've already been thinking about social justice issues. You've already been thinking about, about equity and inclusion. You're already thinking about that. My generation doesn't care. We're generation X and we're like, we were losers from way back. We want this to happen, but we seem to have no power or control, right? <laughs> that's, that's how it feels now because we're all in our fifties, forties and fifties. So it's like, for me, the reason I want to love up teenagers so much is because I think the more support that they get from adults, the more likely they are to change the world and continue to improve, like move forward. And, and I just refuse to roll my eyes. I actually, this, I write this for teenagers because I know you'll understand it. Um, and many adults instead will write a review that said, this makes white people feel bad and not understand how ironic that review is. Now I will shut up and thank you for that question. <laughs> Of an interesting response. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for thanks for that question. That entire answer was quotable. Oh, good. <laughs> Let's quote it. So, <laughs> hi. Hi, my name's Esther. Hi, um, Esther. And I just wanted to ask about like kind of like the books we read in school and curriculum, um, and what your take on reading the classics is. I know that in U32 right now, there's a lot of debate over which of the classics are acceptable to read in class. Um, a specific example is Heart of Darkness, which was recently removed from the curriculum. Um, and we also wanted to know just like where you think a book like Dig could fit into a curriculum and if there's a genre of the classics that it could replace. Okay, great question. Um, okay. So I might have a antiquated or controversial view on the, on the classics and because the classics can cover so many things. Like, I mean, we're not talking about Shakespeare. We're talking about um, largely, I think if we're gonna uh, dead white men, um, <laughs> you know, I think that's what we're talking about 20th century and uh, a lot of times um, white dudes. I think, I think they fit in in a weird way. You know, here's the deal. I love teaching grammar so I can break the rules. I love teaching what good writing, what, what, what acceptable or good writing rules are so that we can break them. And so in a way, I think that we wouldn't understand a book like Dig if we didn't have a read along, if we didn't have something else, right? So To Kill a Mockingbird is a fantastic example. It's a beautiful book. I'm sorry, it is like, and, and it's not, it's, it is now steeped in white saviorism. It's steeped in so many things that we have words for now that, that, that other people had words for then, but we didn't use them. White people didn't, you know, um, but To Kill a Mockingbird is a beautiful story and the story of like how, but we, but it's got problems. We'll use that, that Bo Burnham problematic word. Um, it's problematic uh, for a bunch of different reasons. However, I think it's still worth reading as long as we read it with an eye, with the lens, right? With to be able to look at it and then discuss what is problematic about it. So for me, when we read classics, it's good to be able to look at what's problematic. For example, if we read John Updike, which most people don't, <laughs> though I come from John Updike country, but you know, we should talk about his problematic representation of women. And in fairness, most of those books, we should talk about the problematic um, representation of women and people of color. So uh, it's good to have a little bit of knowledge of the classics. As for where Dig would fit in, I think it's nice to read it alongside something. Um, it has been read alongside To Kill a Mockingbird in at least two schools, from what I understand. Um, it's certainly more modern. It's, it's edgy. It's going to be tough to get past certain, you know, certain people where we are at the moment, at the moment, all of our schools, but I know here in Pennsylvania, we're really dealing with this large uptick in, in book challenges and things like this. So even if there's a swear word in it, um, there's a problem, let alone if there's any sexuality discussed or any sort of things like this. Um, but more importantly, if the white supremacy is discussed, it's also getting banned, which is really quite disheartening but also telling let's be fair then we know what fight we're fighting right we, we can say states rights all we want when we talk about 
<laughs> you know, people are like, we didn't, you know, the Civil War wasn't about slavery. It was about states' rights. And this is kind of the same thing. It's like, this is about appropriateness because of the books. I don't think it is if you're banning books based on the fact that the author is, you know, is Black in the case of, say, uh, York, which is just over the river. Um, but anyway, I think it has a place in schools uh, in probably upper grades because of the content. I would, I would definitely say, you know, uh, not to say that ninth graders can't read it, but some ninth graders might not be mature enough to have the discussions that we're having now. Um, and it's not to, no offense to ninth graders either. I have one. <laughs> so and he's very mature, but um, I think that it's upper grades. And I think that it's, I don't know, it's been used, it's been, it's right now being used as a freshman summer read for a good few college programs. And I think that's a really great way to walk into college, to understand what college you're walking into, to, uh, to, to think about your own privilege before you get on a campus is a, is a really great thing to have. So I think that though that would also transfer to where we could use it in schools. So, um, but as for classics, it's funny, you know, there's some that we really, we need to let go of. And I think that a classics heavy curriculum canon for, for like, if you're looking at like nine to 12, and if it's, if there's more than 50% classics, I think that we need to rethink that because it's not, they're not going to connect as much with today's teens, more so than even us. Like for me, I could read a book from the forties and connect more because I still had a phone connected to the wall. I still, I, you know, I was walking down the street in New York this week and the, the amount of times my son and I were like, Oh, I wonder what that was. And I just said, Hey Siri, blah, blah, blah. And asked the question and she answered it. It's a different world now, truly a different world. It's not just that we move forward. It's that it really is a different world. And I think that our literature and our canon needs to reflect that. No. Awesome. Well, thank you very much. Hey, thanks, Esther. These are great questions and I'm going along, but that's me. <laughs> um, hi, I'm Maya. And okay. a few years ago, we spoke with another author and she talked about using sensitivity readers before publishing her book. And I was wondering if you had any sensitivity readers before publishing, because um, you take on a lot of characters and a lot of different perspectives. And yeah, I'm just wondering how you dealt with that. I'm very lucky to have the editor I have. Andrew Carr is incredibly conscientious when it comes to all of those things. And um, we talked about sensitivity readers more than once. Um, the character in the book, um, Ian, who is really the only ca uh, character of color in the book, uh, that was intentional because I wasn't talking about race in the way that I, you know, I've been wrestling with this. I just want to say this, like I've been wrestling with the idea of race and whiteness and what to do about racism since I was a very young kid growing up where I grew up because it was very, I luckily had a very anti-racist parents. And because I had anti-racist parents, I certainly noticed this stuff more. Um, and, but it really, I mean, it wasn't like, I, I've, before I graduated high school, I'd seen people in full clan robes you know you need to understand in fact before i graduated high school i used to deliver pizza to the grand dragon of the pennsylvania ku klux klan so um and to meetings in his house where he had you know um, nazi flags and he was also a member of the american nazi party and um and portraits of hitler and things like this and so i have been grappling with race a long time so um give me a second sometimes my grief brain gets me what was your question again maya um if you used any sensitivity readers Thank okay. you. Okay. Thank you. All right. So when it came to Ian's role, I was terrified when I published this book. So I didn't know if anybody was going to, you know, take the opportunity to run me through um, the, the painful machine of Twitter <laughs> and other places like that. Um, but we didn't use a sensitivity reader. I suggested it more than once. Andrew read it. We, we, we combed it pretty well. I think he probably had a few people maybe bounce some ideas, but maybe not. I honestly don't know. Uh, between the two of us, we realized what needed to be done um, to make sure that it was exactly what we wanted it to be. Um, I tend to not write out of my lane very much. The experiences in the book beyond just Ian um, are things that either I've experienced or are close to me via the volunteer work that I do. I've written or I've worked with, I've worked with a great many survivors and I am a survivor of a great many things. And so because of that, I feel that I can write points of view like Loretta's family um, or um, Malcolm's family or Malcolm's, you know, and even just the, the completely fractured family that the whole family is. Um, 
I, I have lived through that. And what's interesting is that the, I wrote the book, it came out in March 19, right? Um, and in December of 18, so only three months prior, my entire family was exploded, my birth family. And my own family was had exploded the, the year prior um, through meddling with, like, it's funny, I, I tweeted today something about how we were all, we were taught we're taught that a good life is uncomplicated and free of villains. It is not. You will have villains in your life. You will have people in your life that really screw with you, that really stir the pot and can, in fact, decimate your family. And that is what happened to me. I had one agent decimate both my, my family and my larger family. Um, so when it comes to sensitivity readers, anyway, about those sorts of traumas, I, I don't need them because I've experienced them and I work with people like that. <clears throat> and I've worked with people like that for, for decades, decades and decades. So, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks, Maya. Hello, I'm Kristen. Um, Hi, Kristen. So, so Dick has so many um, layers and small intertwined details. So I was wondering like, what was your uh, thought? Like, what was your writing process? to write the book and how many like drafts did it take? Oh boy. Well, Kristen, a trillion drafts, a trillion drafts. Um, so it started, okay, the writing process was pretty simple. It was the usual Amy stuff. First of all, I use, I didn't realize it was a surrealist, surrealist writing method. I wrote like 27 books before I, a, a student interviewed me and told me about the surrealist writing process. But basically I sit down, I have a feeling, I make a character out of my feeling. I often say basically that my characters are thesis statements. If you wrote an essay about something you cared passionately about, my characters are those thesis statements personified. Sounds weird, right? Anyway, so I started writing um, exactly the order it's in, Godfrey and Mar Marlon Godfrey, and then the, the, the Marx brothers, um, who you know are, are loosely based on people I knew and went to school with. And then I started writing The Shoveler. And then about 60 to 80 pages in, The Shoveler, the, the freak showed up and everything, bummed the cigarette off of him and all that stuff from the early scene. Um, I, the Shoveler stopped telling me stuff. I was like super bored. I was like, dude, you're not even telling me stuff. So um, I threw the book out. I was like, forget it. Uh, I have to start, I have to write another book. So I started writing another book another week. Uh, and it's, it was about this girl named Can I Help You? And she worked the drive through at Arby's and everything was great. And she goes off with her friend and into the park. And then this kid shows up with a shovel and he's shoveling and there's no snow. And I'm like, that is an A.S. King novel. Pull the shoveler back out of the trash can and then try and figure out how they all fit together. Um, so honestly, the early parts, I can't even tell you. Like, I don't even remember when Malcolm showed up and I don't know if he showed up in order. I think he did. I think he showed up in order. Suddenly the book started to come out in order, but I didn't know where it was going. To give you a good idea of how clueless I am when I write my books, this book took about three and a half years to write. And still at the like late two year mark, I keep notes and track changes for myself. And there was a note on next to, um, uh, I don't want to give too many spoilers, but there was a note that said, um, who is this girl? And that's, that was to do with the freak. Who is she? And then only a few pages later, it said, who's the fifth cousin? Why do you keep saying five cousins? Who is the fifth one? So that's how clueless I am in a way as I'm working through a book, right? A lot of that has to do with the fact that I have to pull myself out to teach every month, which I'm not sure serves a book and, or me very well. Um, but either way, um, you know, the layers, I also do really, if you want to see a visual, let me, do I have a visual? Um, I have, yeah, let me show you. I do things like this, Kristen, that, and this isn't for Dig, this is for the book that followed it, Switch. But Diggs was ginormous. It's actually, if you go to the, there's a place called the Horn Book. It's a review site. They have this online with me holding the one for Dig. But, um, and Dig had a lot more colors. In fact, I ran out of colors because they only really make so many highlighters, right? Um, but each part would be color coded. These are the names of chapters. Okay, so this is just a table of contents and that's how I do it, right? So I, I log, um, 
the timeline, like, cause we have to stick into a calendar, right? We still have to do time inside of stories, right? I do all that, but then these are each thread, each one of these is threads. With Dig, it was different points of view. So Marla and Godfrey got a certain color, everybody got a different color. So revision is everything. And I've always said this to all my writers, um, revision is the sport. And so for me, that's where things come together. And that's when I really learn about the book. So when it comes to how many drafts, every day is a draft. Like every, every five minutes is the draft, you know? Um, but with this book, I trusted my gut. That's the biggest thing, having the confidence to trust, trust your gut. Um, and from there, it was just three years of a mix of everything, writing new stuff and revising and getting a whole new ideas, cutting huge chunks, all of it. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Um. Hi, I'm Maddie. Um, uh, I was curious about um, the tunnels in Dig and um, just like how they operate. Like, are they um, a metaphor or like an actual place? Um, and like, they seem to kind of mean different things to each character. So like, um, yeah, how does that work in the Excellent. story? Excellent story. Excellent story. I didn't catch your name because things have glitched out. What's your name again? Oh, um, Addie. Addie? Yeah. Nice. Hi, Addie. All right, Addie. Um, tunnels. Funny you say that. All right. So let's go straight away just to the really obvious ones. So when the shoveler, Marla also has it too. When the shoveler talks about things that really stress them out, the, there's blocks of text that get smaller and smaller. Okay. So when I was first writing this book, and I wish I had the little notebook near me, but I don't. When I first started writing this book, um, I thought that there that it would be in shapes, not not concrete poetry, really. But I just thought that maybe there'd be shapes and tunnels run, running along the bottom of it, which is funny because I think that might happen with the book I'm writing right now. A lot of my books have tunnels in them because um, I think we live a lot of our lives underground. And I do believe that's a quote from another one of my books, um, but, but that we live our lives underground. Um, again, because often we're pretending something isn't happening when it is happening. And that is the story of my life, um, which is, I don't want other people to have a life like that. It's part of the reason I write. But um, so the tunnels meant different things to different people. With the shoveler and Marla in those parts that were very visual, um, they were meant to represent anxiety and, and panic. Uh, I, had this, I had suffered from panic disorder for just a small period of time. And I certainly had situational anxiety um, for quite a bit of time. And it always felt a little bit like I was in a tunnel that was getting smaller, a little bit like when I, I first tried and, and first and last one time tried spelunking. That was the end of that. As the, as if somebody with shoulders, my wide or with shoulders, this wide, uh, it's not made to be a spelunker. Um, but, um, other than that, they, they really, the tunnels represent, this is a great, this is a great question. Cause I mean, I, there are many of my books, so you don't know that Addy, but like they are in many of my books, the tunnels represent where we live our, where we live our lives. I think where we really live our lives, I guess it's in, it's a metaphor for everything, everything from the way we think about ourselves, what we really think of ourselves, what we think we deserve, what we, um, what we do what we do behind the scenes to ourselves and to others in our own minds. I think the tunnels might, I think the tunnels might actually be a metaphor for the mind. I don't even know now that you've asked, this is a, I've usually asked more, more kind of concrete questions about them, but on, on a wider level, like um, I wrote a book called Glory O'Brien's history of the future. And people, <laughs> people keep mentioning that this week due to the Supreme court situation at the moment and women's rights. Um, and in the end, the women, the women who were eventually um, forced out due to many different laws and forced to live on their own um, in, the, in the forests eventually fight a war in the tunnels. That's where they fight the war. So I think we fight wars in our own minds all the time. You know, I think that's what the tunnels represent. It's one of the, the funny part about this with Dig, there was that sinkhole at the end. And it's funny because my entire town is built on sinkholes. In fact, our high school is built on a sinkhole. I think that's hilarious. And that will come into a book one day. But my car really got swallowed by a sinkhole in front of my house a few years ago. And that's why I got interested in sinkholes. So when that happened um, and the, you know, I don't know, and he could look down there and the freak could find that egg, you know what I mean? And all that stuff. It's, it's a connection between the terrestrial world where we have to be good people and, and not good people, good. We have to look good. We have to look good. Right. 
So on on the in the terrestrial, it's all about curb appeal. It's all about what you're wearing, right? But in the real life, I think the real life is lived in the tunnels. There you go. You just you just heard me work out an answer to a question and and work out my own metaphor right in front of you because you asked a great question, Addy. But yeah, that's what it represents. But it also represents anxiety, depression, every anything that puts you in a place that's you that we're not allowed to talk about, right? And we're not allowed to talk about those. And we do now. We talk about them, but we people still look at us kind of funny, right? <laughs> like I'm normal. What about you? It's like we're all normal. What's normal? <laughs> so yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for that question. Eye-opening, and as always, it's always eye-opening questions from people that make me understand my own work better. Thank you. Thank you for mentioning Gloria O'Brien. Oh, hey, I'll show it too if you want, because it's right here. Just saying, I got more letters about this book in the last week. People, and well, first when Donald Trump got elected, I got a letter, so a lot of letters about this book. Anyway, all right, Elijah's back. What you got, yeah, Elijah? I have another question because what you just said to those last two questions was too interesting. Um, so, okay, let's see if I've got my notes correctly here. So, so you were talking first off about um, how how char characters are your feces, um, and that 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 you really write as you go along. So, and and also that that you like this 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 theme of tunnels that you talked about. You share across a lot of your books, and, and a lot of your books have the same idea of tunnels running throughout them. So, so like how how do you work out the I, I it's, it's, it's easy to say that big has a lot of symbolism and thematic elements to it so how how do you tend to work those into writing classes and how how do your books share these ideas of the these, these symbols and thematic elements across each other hmm. great question elijah all right so here's the deal um i never try when it comes to theme when it comes to theme uh, if I'm trying, it feels shoehorned. It feels fake, right? And I refuse to feel fake. It's one of the things that um, freaks people out about me. It's one of the reasons I'm divorced, that's for sure. Um, like, <laughs> I hate to say it, but it was like, I. But, but it also is one of the reasons I have lasting friendships that are 45 years old. It's because if there's a problem with something, I'll go, hey, there's a problem with something. And my friend will go, oh, Oh, okay. Whereas, you know, some people aren't as willing um, to, to work out just real stuff, honestly, that takes place in real time and can be sorted out in five minutes. Um, but some people will make a big deal out of that. Some people, I'm like, I'm, I'm hiding that. Anyway, um, but when it comes to sitting down, I, so I don't fake it. And when the tunnel shows up or when, when a metaphor shows up, um, I roll with it. Like at the moment, Elijah, I'm writing a book, speaking of tunnels, that was based on this drawing right here, it says system and it's a hamster tube. And then inside the hamster tube, there is a chair. Okay. That's all you need to know. I've been staring at this for a year. It's been here for a year. And I'm like, I know what this means. What this means is that I'm going to write about a woman who's sitting in a dinner chair that's in a system of pneumatic tubes that are human sized. And that's how she is. She is carried around her home. It's a metaphor for um, when you're living with a controlling or abusive person, they take, they take control over your, um, they emotionally separate you from your children. It's a very, very common thing that happens in an abusive um, household. And so mom then is um, like, in this case, it's a metaphor for mom being in the tunnel and everybody going, oh, why isn't mom available? Like, this is ridiculous. But in actual fact, mom's there the whole time. It's just you know, in this case, dad has, has made the children iffy on her. So that metaphor is just bam, right? It's obvious. It's, it's like, it's like a punch in the face, that one. Like if you, if you look at it and if now as it's coming out, it's coming out even more brutally um, on the page than I expected it to, but you know, honestly, you trust it. So here, here's an interesting one. All right. So that book that I started writing, see those, Okay, that looks like a plotting sort of thing. And it kind of is, but it's not. It's just a lot of different ideas that are kind of in order. Like I'll know something has to happen. I haven't written the end part yet. I haven't put any post-it notes up there yet, right? But for me, every single thing that's written on those post-it notes was there from that day that I sat down and went, Bleh. I sat down and just sort of vomited out my feelings and my words in character though. Like, so we go back to that thesis statement I'm very upset over this idea that abusive men separate their children from their mothers 
what effect does that have on the mother? What effect does it have on the children? Go. And so immediately it comes out in a character and there's this character named Jane and she is pissed. She is so angry. And she has just discovered at age 16 that this happened to her and that her mother was there the whole time, but she just thought the wrong crap about her. She is so angry. And yet, and she knows she's going to take her dad down and she knows she's going to rescue her mother somehow. And she knows all this, but she doesn't know how yet. And we're about to find out. So am I, because I haven't written the, I'm I'm only 17,000 words into the book, right? But every single idea that's up there is already in the book from that moment when I flushed it all out of my system. They're all hints and they're all there. Right now I'm 70 pages in. Everything I need to know about that book is already in it. I have to go in with my archaeologist tools and find it. So I know I do not lie to God is her first line, right? But then it says, my father is a liar, a thief, a traitor, a brute, and a killer. And I'm like, killer? Hmm, That could be a mystery. That's a fun book. And if you know my books, Dig Included, they are kind of strange mysteries in there. Like who did this? And you know, how, how, how did that happen? And so Um, All of those are hints that are already in the book. It is a cosmic process for me, Elijah. I have to trust what comes in through my crown chakra and my brain sends to my hands and I write it down and then I go from there. So it's truly cosmic. I trust it. I trust in an untrustworthy world. And it's gotten me into a great deal of trouble in my life, but it's also brought me the most joy. All right. Now I'm going to ask one more question. um, I'll try to take more time for myself. Cool. So people often talk about reading um, books, uh, uh, like a lo- the the entire works of an author, right? So so they can like look at the author's like changes in thoughts over time, look look at how these books connect. What would you think about about your books um, being used like that or taught like that, or what 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 do you think with that with this these connections of themes and also how how what what you do with all of that. Wow. Well, I mean, I would welcome that. (laughs) I'd probably say, hey, bring me in, zoom me in like I did now. Um, But also, um, I mean, I do have people who do that, not in classes. Um, I have academics who do this and I do have have academics who teach me in their young adult literature classes and they might teach three or four, two or three, usually three titles of mine um, and probably absolutely talk about those things. Um, But yeah, that'd be fantastic. I mean, what would I think of that? That'd be awesome. And I think that they would discover a great many things. And I mean, now I'm only 51. So I'm like, look, I got at least another 30 years of writing in me. So this is going to be interesting, especially now because I've become very empowered uh, over the last few years. And I I feel a prolific bout coming on. And if I'm to believe my astrologist, I, I believe that's what's about to happen. And so I don't, I don't know where it's going to take me. Hope, maybe I'll finally find my way out of the tunnels, Elijah. What do you think? <laughs> well, thank you. I'll, yeah, now, thank I'll go back to letting other people actually talk to you as well. <laughs> <laughs> don't apologize for your space, brother. Never apologize for taking space. Uh, hi, I'm Avery. Hi, Avery. Um, and I was so, so sort of connected to like abusive relationships um, and Loretta actually, the, the ring mistress. And like, I'm very curious about what's the deal with the flea circus? Like, is that magical realism or is that actually happening in the book? In the book, it's actually happening. Um, flea circuses are a real thing and they do, they do still travel around America. Um, and there's actually, there was one recently here and I didn't go and see it, which I kicked myself. Oh, it was COVID. That's why. And I don't even know if it, I don't know if it came, but I think it did, but it was mid COVID. Um, you know, I don't know where the flea circus came from. I wish I knew. I wish I knew where half these ideas just came. They come up and I'm a part of it is because, I mean, I, I, I know a circus family and I spent a lot of time on the circus, um, in Ireland when I lived there. So, um, so having been behind the scenes, having been nearly stepped on by an elephant once, having been, and also seen, you know, different elephants being very sad and, 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 you know, standing in one place rocking and, and just uh, tiger escapes and <laughs> all that, but also sequins and, 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 you know, all the different talent, the different acts over the, over the decades. So I think circus life is amazing, but I think it was, a, for me, I think it was a metaphor um, for obviously, you know, uh, trying to escape. What, what she was in but the flea circus itself i mean well 
You want to hear the deep metaphor behind that that just came to me? Here you go. You got Loretta, right? Loretta is in this horrible household. Um, let's call it horrible. There's really no other way to put it because that's really quite full on abuse that's going on in that household. Not to say other abuse isn't full on, like the one I just described in the pneumatic tubes, also full on, but not as brutal, right? This is out and out brutal. And what does Loretta have? She has fleas. What do they do? They eat her blood. And um, when you come from a household like Loretta's, you are primed to land with people who will absolutely feed off you. Those people I mentioned earlier, the, the villains, there are villains in our lives and there are people who attract villains. I didn't know this until I attracted so many villains myself. I, I made me stop and go, what is wrong with me that I keep attracting these people? Um, it could be a little bit of codependence. It could be because I'm just massively nice. And I mean that in the nicest way. <laughs> I'm not nice to everybody. Now I'm sort of like, I have my boundaries. I know how to draw them. But I also refuse to be a, a dick. If, am I allowed to say that on podcasts? Okay, let, I can, I'll go. I, okay, good. Um, I don't want to be one of those. Um, so, but with Loretta, that I think that was an unintentional or at least fell into place metaphor for the fact that she's preparing herself for what she's about to endure. You know, I mean, a lot of people are like, Oh, Loretta, I can't wait to save her. I'm like, well, if you save her, you better buy her like decades worth of therapy. because She's going to need it. Um, you know, and some deprogramming and other things. But I think that that's really the deal with the flea circus. Yes, it was real. Yes. It kept her, it gave her friends, it gave her companions. It helped her um, having that audience that was in her mind really helped her. Um, I think it, it helped her understand that um, what was happening in her house wasn't normal, but what's about to happen to her and what, what she really is, is she's going to be fodder for other, other people. If she doesn't watch out, she's going to walk straight into it. Probably like the rest of us, most survivors of early childhood trauma walk straight into it. So um, yeah, deep, but <laughs> deep, but there's my answer. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks for a great question. I love talking to people who read books because I, like I said, I end up learning more about my own books. It's fantastic. <laughs> this is the best part of being a writer. That's why, that's why I'm like, Hey, zoom me in. I can learn more about what the heck I put in that book. Hi, um, I'm Kate. And, uh, yeah. I was wondering about, um, you've been talking a lot about, uh, how you write with like surrealism and, um, I was wondering how that helped, that writing technique helped you um, uh, unpack the themes of like white supremacy and um, the patriarchy and all the other themes in DIG, yeah. how you use that to your advantage. Well, you know, great question. Um, the surrealist writing method is about two things now that I understand it a bit better. And it, I, again, I don't want to call it that in a way because I'm almost giving Andre Breton and the Surrealists credit for what I did for like 26 years with, without even knowing about them, right? At the same time, one of the images I want to give you about the Surrealist writing method is this, okay? Andre Breton and Louis Aragon were in a field hospital in Paris during World War I. Now try and smell that for me. Try and see that for me, right? It was bonkers. It was horrific. World War I was a bloody war. All wars are bloody wars. Um, but World War I was particularly gross. And um, so there they are. And there's a great, etch, a great like drawing of this somewhere. There's a few of them. You can actually look it up somewhere online. Um, but there is um, all of these dudes, all these soldiers on the, on the floor and on, on, you know, litters probably on little, you know, um, what do you call them? Litters is the best I got. Anyway, and they are in different states of of disarray. They are wounded soldiers. They could be missing a leg. They could have a belly wound. They could be whatever. They're all bandaged up. And in the front of the room is a stage. And on it is, a, is an upright piano and someone playing it. And somebody else has like a top hat and a cane and they're entertaining. Stop and tell me how messed up that is. That's the most surreal thing ever. And yet these men on the floor, the trauma they're going to carry with them is bonkers, right? It's huge. They're going to come away with PTSD, complex PTSD, 
so many different things. They're, I mean, they're, they could split. They could, that was, uh, the mental health issues that soldiers have are A, very serious, B, very ignored in our world, which is why we, we keep having wars, but then not having to deal with this. It's amazing. The guys who start the wars um, never have to really deal with the PTSD um, or anything else. But anyway, so for me, go back to why do I write? I write because I live through trauma. I'm still living through trauma. Um, I also write because I care very much about other people with trauma. And I like to talk about trauma because in our, in our culture, we don't talk about trauma. And then it trips us up. And we go through our lives thinking that a good life is an uncomplicated, drama-free life. How many people talk about, oh, no drama, really? What kind of interesting life are you living? Really, what kind of lie are you living? Every one of us has drama and, and weirdos and villains come in and out of our lives. So when I want to talk about trauma, um, especially with young people, one of the best codes, right, in is, is surrealism. Because A, young people are willing to go, what the heck is this about? And dig deeper versus go, this is stupid. I feel bad for, for being white. I'm, I'm putting it down and clutching their pearls and walking away. But when I want to talk, I want to talk to young people about their trauma because most adults don't and they don't take it seriously and because they didn't take their own trauma seriously. And this again has to do with our generations, right? We go back to generation tw um, 11 and 12 um, and then mine 13 and now yours 15. And we get to this place where it's like, when are we finally going to take the intergenerational trauma that we're all carrying with us seriously? And if we want to take that away, I, I want to be able to shift that. Here we are. We're white people. Okay. For the most part, I'm no offense. I don't want to make any assumptions, but I, we're all, you know, I'm a white person. Now, imagine the intergenerational trauma that comes with being a person of color in America. Imagine the generation, intergenerational trauma that comes from being a native person, an indigenous person in America. Um, and I believe that the pain and the blood and is in the soil. And here's the deal. It seeps up through our feet. So if you're a person of color, that's a different type of feeling. If you're indigenous, that's a different type of feeling. But if you're white, there's a lot of shame and guilt and trauma in the fact that our ancestors did what they did <laughs> so that we can say we're the greatest nation on earth, which is a bunch of bunk. If you ask me, we're a good nation. We could be better. We could be so much better. Um, and so the reason I use surrealism is to touch the trauma. It's one of the best ways to get into trauma. It's one of the best ways to talk to young people about it and to get all readers. I mean, this is one of the, and, and this family, when I think about this family, this family is trauma from the very top. What happened to Marla was so minor, but that uncle laughing at her and how it all went down and how that affected her shame because we walk around with it. So we've got this big shame organ and one person goes ping when we're eight, like pings it, right? Flicks it. And next thing you know, for the rest of our lives, we're an asshole. Imagine if we could at least go, oh, we have this shame. Oh, the shame's because of this. Oh, okay. And then be better off instead of being a jerk about it, you know? Um, and that's, that's why. That's the long answer and short answer of why. I use surrealism in order to talk about trauma because trauma needs to be talked about. And I will go to my grave screaming that because um, it's how we get better. And it's how we do live good lives. We live good lives by facing the complications and facing the villains, villains in our lives. Um, and then moving forward despite them. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. I want to stay here all day talking to you guys. I am in love with this conversation. <laughs> Great. <laughs> I am too. <laughs> uh, hi, I'm Jonah. I wanted to ask if you've experienced any backlash for Dig or like white rage fighting back. All right. Hey, Jonah, how's it going? Here's the thing I did on April 10th, 2010. I stopped reading online reviews um, by amateurs. Uh, the only reviews I read are those from trade magazines. And in those, I saw nothing. I did happen to go to Amazon one day to cat. This is way back, like soon after it was published. And I, I went to cat, grab something else from that page. And for some reason, I saw there was one one-star review. And I did this thing that I hadn't done since 2010. I was like, well, if it's really long and really bad, um, you know, I guess I'll, I'll just check it out anyway. And it was very short. And all it says is don't read this book because it makes you feel bad about being white or something. And I thought, oh, good. I did my job. 
as other than that, um, I have not received any hate mail as of yet um, on the band book, the, the band book, the, the list from the guy in, in um, the, the representative in Texas um, that's been circulating through um, I would call them hate groups, actually. I don't know where, um, I don't know what the name of their group is, but it's basically to destroy things versus build beautiful things. Um, but that, one of my books landed on that, but Dig did not, which shows you that they didn't, they're not reading. They're just, they're just pulling books off of other lists. So I have not gotten the backlash yet, but let me tell you, Jonah, the minute somebody reads this from that crew, I will be, I'll let you know, but it'll, it'll come at some point. And, or maybe I, maybe I finessed it enough. I mean, this is the thing, like, I'm not really here to say these people are bad. Um, I'm more just to say, here are these people. What do you think in a way? Right. And you guys read it and went, oh, okay. These people are bad. <laughs> these people, you know, these people have problems. They do have problems. Um, but, you know, I don't know. I get a lot of, I get a lot of love for this book from 70 years old to 14 years old saying, well, how did you know my family? You know, I'm so glad you wrote this. So I get more of that, but so far, no backlash yet. But I tend to be soft censored. This is the other thing I, I should say. Like when I'm censored in a school or a band, I'm I'm banned softly, which means they'll go onto Amazon or another place like that, and if and they'll read the one star reviews specifically um, to see is there any like is there f are there f words are there this are there that um, is there any sort of oh sexuality oh no none of that for the teens because that never happened. Um, <laughs> like I roll my eyes um, uh, or other things, you know, but because it's about white supremacy, I think somebody's going to get their hands on it one day, but whatever, you know, let them, let them, let them clutch at their pearls. Um, so far it's been okay, but I don't know other than that. I, I stay in a very safe little bubble so I can continue writing books about trauma for young people <laughs> to, to, to free them. I prefer to stay in my bubble. Yeah. Great question. Thank you. Oh, Jeannie, my stomach is growling and you're probably going to pick it up. <laughs> Good. I'm glad your mic isn't picking it up. Hello. Hi, I'm Ellie. Um, Hi, Ellie. So my question is, politeness is wielded as a tool of white supremacy culture in like two very different ways. In Marla's case, it's kind of used like for control. And um, in Can I Help You's case, it kind of gives her a sense of worth. So like, was that intentional and like, can you talk about that a little bit? Do you mean you said politeness, right? I'm just making yeah. sure. Yeah. Um, ah, you guys have great questions. Um, politeness. Well, I mean, can I help you? Is a fantastic rep. Like that's a metaphor right there for politeness, right? And her mother is. I, I her mother has the bell, which I actually have downstairs. I did not smash it with a hammer yet. I've yet to do it. I, I COVID came, and for some reason the bell lived. Um, but. Um, not to say that it was, again, I had anti-racist parents. It was, that came from a grandmother who wasn't so anti-racist. Um, but um, politeness is used um, constantly, actually. It's one of the reasons, well, polite, polite conversation. Let's go into that. Let's go into that term, right? What is polite? Um, yes, Jeannie asked me, and the, yes, the, the bell is real. It's downstairs. Um, it's very small and very touristy. It's ridiculous. Um, Anyway, polite conversation. Let's think of that. Polite conversation, well, we just talked about trauma. <sighs> can't talk about that in polite conversation. Uh, racism, poop, can't talk about sexism. Can't talk about that. I actually mentioned the other day that I was had had a man published uh, switch or any of my surrealist titles that they would be lauded for. And I'm not, I'm not saying I'm not lauded. I'm not here to like, I don't care. I don't mind. I like writing the books I write. I'm very happy with my life. I'm just saying that the business and the culture would elevate a, a, a male writer for writing what I write. And they wouldn't kind of bench him uh, as far as they concern. They, they think YA is a, a bench. I think it's actually a, a, a hot air balloon that takes me higher and higher. But most of the things I talk about period are not polite conversation. Um, and so I think that's one of the things that keeps everybody down, but keeps white people in a place of privilege, keeps men in a place of privilege, absolutely. Um, but politeness on a whole is the reason we don't talk about things. And I honestly, to me, that is the most bizarre idea that I can't even argue against it. It's just sort of like looking at somebody going, what are you talking about? Like, I kind of just have this horrible look on my face, like, what? Like, 
ew, like who would, how are you interesting? What do you talk about then? Just the nice, you know, country music or something. And, uh, you know, I don't know what people talk about if they don't talk about problems. If we're not talking about our problems, I don't know, but you're right. And that's not considered polite. And so um, that's how we wield it, I guess. I mean, we wield it by saying, well, it's not polite to talk about race. It's not polite. And I mean, that's been said many a time. Oh, you can't talk about race because we're all white people. So we can't talk about race. Actually, we can very much talk about race. Um, all white people we can talk about whiteness, um, which is our race. If we have to check a box, there's the box. It says it, you know. Um, I like how a lot of times it says Caucasian. I'm like, that's not actually what that word means, by the way. <laughs> There's a place in Asia uh, that those people come from, and uh, those are Caucasian people. We are white. Let's just call it what it is. But we don't like that. We politely call it something else. How weird. So we already know there's a problem with it. That's why we put Caucasian on the thing. But we don't want to talk about the problem with the word white because we're white. It's so weird. It's just to me like that, that is like, I love your question, but at the same time, it, the idea of it, right. The concept of it is just so bizarre and not bizarre. There's a better word for it. Um, farcical. And the idea is so farcical that I want to leave it over there where it belongs. Yeah. You know? Kind of in a way. I, and I don't know what to say about it. Cause I just don't live that life. I've never have. It's one of the reasons why I have the friends I have and the people surrounding me are the people surrounding me. You know what I'm saying? By this age, the people know what they're dealing with. I'm a real in Jamaica, they call it real, 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 not just real. I'm real, real. And it's true. And, I, but I don't like, hopefully I don't bring like downer conversations to Thanksgiving either. I don't know. I also can have fun, I don't know. but it's real fun because I've already dealt with the trauma. See, it's not fake fun. That's the reason we do this. Right. <laughs> Thank so, you. So, so what about can I help you? <laughs> Elijah's like, I got another, I got an idea. I'm running, do it, do it. Well, there's this contrast. I don't know if Elijah's going to mention this between um, not politeness is not talking about something and gimme. So that was exactly what I was going to ask about. Ask. So, I mean, yeah. So, so there is this contrast between the politeness of, uh, of Marla, which is, which is, I mean, it's, 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 it's exactly what you talked about, but, but there's also this whole thing with, with, can I help you like wanting people to say please and, and talk about this whole thing with gimme, gimme, and, and also that whole code word with please to buy uh, weed. Yep. Um, and so, so, so just, just how, how, how does that factor in? Cause I mean, I, I call that like, I, I, I think I'd use the same word, but I think they are two different, two entirely different things. So it may not make sense to use the same word for them, but how, how does that factor in with this? Yeah, I think, I think you've nailed it. I mean, can I help you? I mean, don't forget, she is, she is uh, not very, she doesn't like those gimme people. Well, I mean, look, that's privilege, right? And it's so funny because we're all taught, oh, say please and thank you. But then we get to the drive-thru and I know this because I listen and I, I used to run a drive-thru at Arby's, but I didn't sell weed through the window because <laughs> that's, that's the fun part of writing fiction. Um, I, I wasn't, I didn't think of that then. Um, but anyway, just kidding. Um, we are gimme, gimme, gimme people. We are. I had, a, I had a person, you know, I had a guy step right in front of me recently. And I had a guy decide that he was going to get in the car wash line in front of me, just like, just to do it. And then he sat there and he didn't move forward and go into the, he didn't even know I was there. He didn't know I was there. And so I think that, I mean, gimme is, I mean, that's, privilege that's that's privilege right there you know um and um and yet politeness it's funny because we we demand we live a double standard all of us for the most part okay and that's one of the things that drives me a little bit bonkers about um a lot of things i mean i can i can do it in i can i can go off on it when it comes to um uh, my relationships with men will say, or why am I making it sound like there was more than one? There wasn't, I was married a very long time, but, um, <laughs> you know, I was married a very long time, but in that relationship, you know, you look at that sort of privilege and, and what people expect the expectations. Um, and the expectation in my, in my life was that I wasn't going to talk about the truth, which makes no sense. Like, um, because if you know me, you know, I'm going to talk about the truth and that would, but I, it was, it's always framed as, 
that's politeness. You know, it's polite. And, and, and you've hurt me if, if, if you're talking about the truth. And I'm like, that's weird because you're hurting me if you're not talking about the truth. So there's, I feel like almost there's two different types. It's a little bit Star Wars, right? It's a little bit black and white of me to say this, but that there is like, there are the people who are willing to talk about the stuff that's happening. There's people who aren't. Um, and what we do though, to shame the people who are willing to talk about what's really happening is we say that's impolite. Um, as for the gimme people, they're the first people to complain when somebody doesn't say please or thank you. They didn't send me a thank you note for the gift I gave them. Really, are you literally saying gimme to a child because you sent them a gift? In my world, a gift is something given. You don't give gifts to get thank you notes. If you give gifts to give thank you notes, you're bonkers and you're overdoing it. Um, you're, you know, there's no reason. Like, I'm sorry, there's times to send, send thank you notes. Absolutely. I will send you a thank you note out of the bottom of my heart when I want to thank you. If you don't give a gift because you're giving it, what are you doing? You're manipulating, right? And that's exactly how politeness is used, right? It's manipulating all the time. It's constant manipulating. We are manipulated so much by every corporation, every politician, sometimes every family member, every person we meet. Manipulation is kind of the backbone of our language, right? When we speak, how we speak, how we do things, because why? Because we want to get things, because technically it's gimme. Underneath all that is gimme. And it's interesting because the same person that uses that manipulation will turn around to you and say, you know, you really should be more polite. Or are you going to mow your grass? Or, or you know, you're, you're, there's a few leaves in your flower bed. I live in a town now. It's so weird. People are so weird. I used to live on a farm. No one cared about my leaves before. People care about my leaves now. I'm like, you know, and, I'm, and I, I do them once a week, like when the truck comes and sucks them up, which right there, also hilarious to a farm girl. Like a truck comes and sucks up leaves, mind blown. But I get it. I, and they have to manage their town and it's wonderful. But this is the thing. People think that me sucking up my leaves is polite. But <laughs> talking crap about my back or behind my back, uh, talking crap behind my back about, say, my life, my situation, um, even even as I mean, in, people talk people talk badly about my household because my daughter died. How about that one? We don't talk about death enough in this country so that and people want sympathy when their mom goes or when, when anybody goes. But when I lose my daughter, suddenly it's like, oh, well, that's a sin, first of all. And she, it mustn't have been a very nice home. Like that is the first thing we do. In, and I don't mean to like drop that information on you, but it's just a very interesting way to look at the double standard of politeness because these people want politeness and then they'll treat my family like this. It's so weird. Um, but they don't understand that, that that can happen to them any day either. I know this because I work with people who've lost, same as I did. Um, and they don't understand. They think, oh, that can't happen to my family. Oh, oh, that's not true. Um, and that's the problem. Eventually it catches up with us. But I don't know if I just went off on that. But yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it, that's, that's, how they, that's how they work. It is a double standard. It's just a, it's a massive double standard. <sighs> I think I'm actually done. Wait, one, more yeah, one, more one more question. All right, cool. So I got to go. I got to go to a training session. I'm... <laughs> okay. So, um, so when I was reading it, uh, I was obviously reading it with the book group, but my mom was reading it at the same time as me. And we, there's so much to dig into. And even though like she's older and some people would say wiser, like we still have like the equal amount to talk about. So what would you say to people who mistakenly believe that YA literature is too easy and doesn't mean rigor to be taught? <laughs> oh boy. Well, I will say that people who say that YA literature is anything haven't already, they already haven't read enough YA literature. I, I teach YA literature um, and I teach literature for young people. And what you'll find if you actually study it is that there is as many different types of literature for children as there are for adults. So if you want to walk into a bookstore and say all books suck, then that's your that's that's you being oversimplified. Um, that's what I would say to that person. You're you know if you're saying all YA literature isn't blah, that would be like saying all 
uh, literature for adults is whatever. I guess they put down romance the most, right? Or fantasy or paranormal romance or God knows, I don't know, whatever. Whatever they want to put down, they'll put it down. Adults will put down things for teenagers before they'll put down anything else though. They will roll their eyes at you faster than anything else. They will, they will make you small. I don't understand it. You are only coming into your adulthood and your lives. The whole point of our existence as adults is to lift you up, not bring you down. So the first thing I'd say to anybody saying that is, Wow, you don't respect teenagers. What a shame for you. Why are you working with them? That's the first thing I would ask them. Why are you working in teenage? For te- why are you on a school board? You clearly do not understand teenagers, nor do you care about them. You see, you see them as so small. It's the exact same as if they want to make fun of, I don't know, I'll say Justin Bieber, but that's not what kids listen to anymore. <laughs> but, you know, uh, when whoever, whoever it is, they'll roll their eyes. And my, my days, it was Culture Club or Prince. Oh, God, you know, like, like none of us understood what Prince was talking about. Every single one of us knew what Prince was talking about. You can put a big sticker on the front of it and say parental warnings. Prince says stuff that you already do whatever anyway um as for (laughs) as for people thinking that books written about young adults aren't shouldn't be in schools being read by young adults especially um i'll I'll say literary novels i would consider this a more literary novel um if we wanted to put subcategories uh the way that we do um in adult work which we should I don't know what to say to them um, with a, you know, you're going to get your Shakespeare. You're going to get to read the Merchant of Venice. You're going to get to read perhaps Mockingbird, perhaps, oh, I don't know, whatever classics are in your canon. The idea is, is that teenagers feel seen. The idea of reading a book is to feel seen. The idea of, of reading a book is to open your mind to a new world because you see yourself in it, if that makes sense. Um, and, and also to learn about other people, right? I would, I would hope that people who, who read um, something like Dig might read something that's a little more, certainly more commercial, more popular, but something like The Hate You Give, which was published only, I think, maybe two years before it, um, and allows you to see and feel what it feels like to be a person of color in a community where, you know, where, the world is different, that's for sure, for, for a totally, for, for human beings that live in the same place as we do, and we're, not, we're so privileged, we don't see that. So it'd be a great conversation, um, uh, both for adults and teenagers. But I don't know, I mean, the idea that people would think that something like Dig wouldn't be for teenagers makes me understand that, well, I already know this, I hear this a lot. They don't understand teenagers, and they don't want to. They don't want to stop and understand the teenagers. You know, the, the idea that people don't, here's one for you. If, I, if someone says the word sex in front of a teenager, everybody freaks out. First of all, without it, those teenagers wouldn't exist. Let's start there. None of us would. It's like periods. People freak out over periods. Why? Without them, none of us would exist. Um, makes no sense. But we freak out over it. And, and not only that, like 51% of, let's not even go there, but they have them, you know, but like this idea that we can't talk about drugs. Oh, don't talk about drugs. Really? We used to have, we used to have commercials with a frying pan and an egg, and this was your brain on drugs. Like, and then, and then I had my kid, we were walking around the other day and he was like, so like, how come you can, you can people can like have a drink, but then they don't become alcoholics. But then people say, don't touch heroin because you're going to get addicted. Like, what's the deal? I'm like, he didn't know the basics about drugs because we're no longer teaching it in health classes anymore because, oh, we're too polite to do that. Um, Which to me goes back to what young adult books are really doing. They're delving into the ideas and the things that, that are, that teenagers need to discuss to have healthy lives. Um, so whether it's something, and a lot of times it's heavy material. Yes, there's death. Yes, there's even like, oh my gosh, suicidal ideation, self-harm, uh, mental illness, but also race, but also love. Also maybe some some relationship abuse or maybe a really great relationship. Why? Not? That's what books are for, to model really good things for us and to warn us off the bad things and to help us see what's really going on. Why you would want to keep that from teenagers? 
I do not know. That would be someone who, as far as I'm concerned, is anti-intellectual, anti your intellectual freedom as young people, which is why public libraries and libraries and schools and librarians are heroes, because they care about your intellectual freedom teachers as well. Um, for the most part, depends on where you are, I guess, because not all teachers, I guess, uh, would. But um, I would think young adult books are for are for young adults because they're going to see themselves in them. And I think young adults are for adults because they'll see their teenagers in them and they better wake up and understand that the world has changed. Um, and they might better be able to have better conversations with and better relationships with their teenagers, which is incredibly important. And as someone who lost a teenager, who had a really great relationship with my teenager, I, I knew I knew the situation with my daughter. She struggled a very, very long time. And we talked a lot. Um, and I, I do this work, you know, I've done this work for a long time, long before I lost my daughter. Um, and I would not have been able to have the conversations I had with her had I not had an open mind to the teen experience. The idea that we were all perfect as teens is ridiculous. Um, uh, but the, the fact that we're still trying to snow them into believing it, that's not new at all. They've been doing that for generations. <laughs> so um, what would I say? I would say, oh, grow up. That's what I would say to anybody saying that young adult books shouldn't be read in schools. I'd say grow up. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you. You guys, students that just asked me questions. I know people are going and coming, but thank you very much for your questions. Meg, wow. Hey, well, I'm gonna, I've got tears in my eyes. I'm shaking. I mean, what a champion you are for our young people, Amy. You are a gift to us. You're a gift to librarians where I can give a book to students with my whole being and my whole heart and open a door to the world that you create and honor them through by speak by being real by being fun by being honest and telling them the truth that they're not hearing in other places so thank you so much thank you so much for supporting me it's a huge deal i got a lot of a lot of teachers and a lot of librarians who back off of me and i'm i'm cool with it i get it but we got all your books spread out on the table. We got we got your whole collection here. Maybe we'll, we'll Elijah and I will design the curriculum that they, they, they awesome. AS King. Well, seminar. listen, Meg. Whatever happens when you do anything AS King again, have me in. Just just let's just do this. Let's zoom me in. That's that's what I do. I like to connect, and I'm about to be on the road again and do stuff. I'm gonna start start. I, I think I'm just going to like staple an N95 mask to my face and just start traveling again. I miss being with young people and going into schools and, and talking um, and just being able to talk openly about stuff and blow their minds uh, in what I call the trauma comedy, <laughs> trauma comedy show, <laughs> but they don't know it. And it's not, I, I don't want to ever bum anybody out. You know, I always just want to help. I always just want to help. I really appreciate what you just said because I rereading dig, I laughed so hard and I, yeah. <laughs> also am aware that you're writing about trauma and like the capacity to hold both the humor and the trauma in one place is really powerful. Thank you, Amy. All right. See you guys. Thanks for your great questions. Thanks for reading the books. Thanks for being champions. You're amazing. <laughs>